Um, so welcome everybody. Uh, we're gonna talk. Uh, we're just gonna have a talk about writing and and reading and and becoming a writer. Um, I'm 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 not gonna read long bios of everybody. Um, you all have programs. You can click on our website and you get the bio of every person. Um, but I'm just gonna go around and I'll just show you who each person is. Uh, to my right over here, we have Percival Everett, winner of the prize for fiction this year. D.G. Nanuk Okpik, poetry. <laughs> Ling Ma, also fiction. <laughs> and Darren Anderson, nonfiction. <laughs> so it's great to have you all here. Uh, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. I, I should say that the, the, the title of this particular event is a little bit of an accident. Um, we often split this panel into two panels. We have on becoming a reader and on becoming a writer. And, uh, and so this year, as we were planning these, I had them both tagged as reader slash writer until we kind of figured out who was going to be on each panel and, uh, and which day it was going to be happening. And then it didn't turn out scheduling-wise that we were going to be able to do panels, uh, two, two, do two panels. Um, so, and then I forgot to take the slash out of the title, and so we're, we're doing two panels in one today. Um, but I thought maybe as a way of introducing the topic, because I think you know, it's sort of a cliche that you know, one becomes a writer after becoming a reader, but it's also you know, kind of true as well. Um, and I, I, I wonder, you know, what do you think about that relationship between reading and writing? Like where, you know, where, 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 how do those two form a part of your origin story as a writer, and, and how do they uh, form a part of your ongoing uh, practice as a writer? First of all, why don't we start with you? Why me? Um, <laughs> well, you know, first of all, reading is the most subversive thing we can do. Um, we do it alone. Um, no one, even if they're looking over our shoulder at what we're reading, knows what we're taking in. So that's exciting to me. Um, the, I trace, I, I have a habit of reading everything uh, that, that I can. I, uh, ironically, I don't read very much fiction. Um, uh, and that partly is because I, I teach and, and, and people are always giving me their fiction to read. Um, but when I was in, I think it was fifth grade, um, it was a, a history teacher that sort of changed the way I think about the reception of the world, about of, of making meaning of everything. Um, and it was right after the assassination of Martin Luther King. Um, we were 11, and we were sitting in the classroom and we were talking excitedly about this you know, sensational event. And um, we'd all seen our parents moved by this, but we were 11. And my history teacher, who was really quite distraught, looked at all of us. This was a, an all black school. She looked at all of us and said, you don't even know who he was. And it was like a dagger to me as I, I thought, I don't know what the other students said, but I thought, she's right. And I vowed right then that I would never feel that way again. And so that's where I started reading seriously. Um, and suffice to say, I would not write if I did not read. Mm -hmm. Gigi, how about you? I learned to read and write. I couldn't complete a sentence when I started college, and so I had to take remedial English. And I learned to read and write because I read the autobiography of Malcolm X, and he learned to read and write incarcerated just by taking the dictionary, opening it up, and reading it from front to back. I do the same every day or all the time, as much as I can. And that way, it gives me access to writing. Um, I don't know 
if I didn't have that skill, then I don't know what I'd do. I breathe to read and I breathe to write. And to me, they're, they're a duality. They're, they're bound together as one. And I use that in my work um, to convey to the community or to the reader that um, we are one. And that's where I come from. Ling? Um, I often get asked this question of like, do you have a specific moment when you knew that you were a writer? And I don't. <laughs> I have a specific moment when the first time I thought I would like a, have a, I had a specific moment of which job I would like. And this was in, I think, third grade in Omaha, Nebraska somewhere. <laughs> uh, and I just thought I want to be a book reviewer. And it was just so I could keep reading, really. Um, <laughs> reading for me coincided with uh, moving to the States. I was about six, and that was around the time I learned to read. And it's very funny because um, I, something I didn't realize when I moved from uh, China to the States is that uh, I would be losing my first language in some way. And I think reading in English really locked me in to English. It's kind of like um, opening a door to go to another room and you don't realize that the door behind you just automatically locks. And, but I, I really needed, I think I really needed reading kind of as a survival tool, um, you know, as a kid, so, yeah. I, I just want to follow up to that. I, I wonder, you know, you, you mentioned at some point uh, over the last couple of days about how, you know, you said, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm effectively American, um, <laughs> right? And, and that yeah. sense of like coming into English and closing the door behind you. But I wonder like now as you've, you know, matured and you've, 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 you've written a lot, do you find that that door opens back up somehow and, and, and works its way into, into what you do? I've definitely excavated a lot about my past and about my family um, in writing, but it's in writing English, and I think there's a part that's always going to be a little bit uh, hidden or obscured um, from me. You know, in Severance, I never reveal, uh, at one point, the main character, who's Chinese-American, she, she tells her Chinese name to someone in China, and I specifically never uh, revealed what her Chinese name was, and I, I think I wanted to sort of keep that as a placeholder of um, a placeholder in some way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and Darren, I have a follow-up that's kind of similar for you, but I want to ask the first question about the reading and the writing. For so I have a strange kind of relationship with reading and writing. Um, I'm an obsessive reader and writer. Um, I have to do it. It's like breathing. I, it's just a necessity. And I would do it if no one wanted to read my stuff. I'd do it anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but in a way, I, I, don't, I don't know if I'm either of them. I think what I do is I'm a collector. I think I collect things. My dad was... Um, a hoarder, really, of, of kind of objects. And I think I do the same, uh, only in ideas and things I find, and people I find, and places I find. I grew up um, in a kind of oral tradition. My grandfather was a trollerman, and he used to come back. He was a smuggler as well. He was a minesweeper. Um, he would come back with all these stories of things that he dredged up from the sea and storms and the, the war, the Americans came in and, and on the, in the Atlantic convoys and he was there smuggling to them and he was there when the, the U-boat fleet were sank off the coast of Ireland, he was there. He saw the Luftwaffe coming into Bomb Derry and he was in a little fishing boat with his dad in the middle of the night and he claims that the plane was so low that he could see the faces of the pilots. Hmm. And then he heard this massive explosion. So he, he brought these stories and I collected them in my mind and my memory. And my dad um, was a gardener groundsman in the cemetery. He spent his days digging graves and, and flower beds and he would find objects and bring them back. And every single object seemed to contain a story, mm. like, it's, it had, like a genie in a bottle. 
So I've just been collecting these things. So in a way, I feel like I, I kind of, I'm an obsessive reader and writer, but I, I can't say that I'm, I'm qualified in either of those things. I just, I collect. Also, my dad was um, a voracious reader. And I think he passed on the first book I ever loved, which was Robert E. Stevenson's Kidnapped, which totally changed my life. I'd probably be a lawyer right now if I hadn't read that book. <laughs> um, but uh, my dad was actually, um, couldn't write, and um, right until the day he died, and in fact, the, the end of his life, he couldn't communicate for the last six months because he couldn't, he was in ICU and he couldn't write, or he couldn't even use the alphabet chart. So there must be some connection with my obsession with writing that comes from the fact that he couldn't write mm. and the injustice of that. Mm. And you grew up in Derry in Northern Ireland um, in the 80s, and I think that that's an, a, a really interesting force in your work is that it, it's, it's very, some of your work is very grounded specifically in that place, in that time, and in the, histor in the history of that as it relates to you personally and to your family. Mm -hmm. um, but then I think you also have this kind of like abstract relation to place that sort of leads you through things like Calvino and so forth yeah. and, and, and cities as these kind of abstractions. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about place in your yeah. work. Yeah, well, um, Calvino's a huge influence and George Perec is another huge influence. They were part of a movement called Olipo. And um, they both had very, very, uh, they had heavy lives, you know. Calvino was in the Italian resistance. The Nazis took his family hostage. <coughs> and uh, while well, he was in the mountains. And then he comes down from the mountains after the war and he writes this fantastical literature. George Perec's parents, uh, his father was killed fighting the Nazis and his mother was murdered in the Holocaust. And George Perec doesn't write these traumatized memoirs, you know, misery memoirs we would call them in Ireland. Um, he writes these playful books that are full of games, but in the case of both, even though they're going to these fantastical places, um, the traumas are in there. They're just hidden. Mm -hmm. You have to go find them. And there's a generosity that they, they have to the reader that I try and put into minds as well, at least attempt it, um, to allow the reader to have a journey of their own and not just tell them something or not just do an exposition dump of trauma on the people. I want them, I, I want them to have that feeling that I had when I was eight years old, reading Kidnapped, and being there with Alan Breck Stewart, getting chased across the Scottish Highlands. Like, I, I was so influenced by that book, I went and lived in Scotland for a decade. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like being in that book. Um, so, yeah, the, the places these books take you, physical places is extraordinary if you, if you follow them, and I want my books to be like maps that people can follow. Mm. Mm -hmm. DJ, I feel like you're somebody who, for whom place is really significant, having grown up in Alaska. And I, and I, I'm, 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 I love the way that those landscapes, like those physical spaces, work their way through the language. But then, you know, similar to what I was saying about Darren, there is this kind of like abstraction to place in your work that I don't think it takes that same kind of abstract form as like an Italo Calvino, but it, 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 it works its way into a, a more sort of mythological mm -hmm. realm uh, for you. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. Yes, um, I carry stories from home and they're oral stories. And so I can't um, speak the language, but I can read it. And I, I've learned um, to read it with phonetics. I took phonetics and alf alphabet, uh, phon uh, phonetics and reading. And so then um, I was able to deconstruct the language and I use it. Um, I write in Inupiaq, then I write in English, and I write in Inupiaq, and then I write in English again. So that transference can arrive and show me the way because I get lost in translation. I get lost with language and I love it so much that I don't know how to use it, but I think it comes to me in such a, a way that I don't know where it comes from, but I do know that I carry that and it's a responsibility at home um, um, to have so many stories. Um, to understand and and 
catalog within your with yourself and to reside interior and then bring it to the exterior world and that's that's where I reside. Mm. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Percival, do you have a place that's significant for you uh, in, in your formation as a writer? Well, I suppose many places. Mm. Um, um, I, I, I suppose I would be accused of being a, a Westerner. Um, that's the landscape in which I feel most comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of my work is set in the American West. Um, but I honestly, I honestly, don't know. I, I, interestingly, with my work, I think it's some places that I don't write about that's more important to me. Mm. Um, I, I lived in Miami, and I've written a lot of books, and I, I don't think Miami is mentioned once. <laughs> uh, and I don't know why that is. Um, 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 but pl I can't, and my work are, is set in many different places, but I can't write about a place I don't know. Mm. So most most of my work is research, and if I am going to write about some place, I I go there. Mm. Mm. I think one of the things that really interests me so much about your work is the way that um, you are you're able to work in all of these different sort of genre conventions, whether it's like a spy novel or a police novel uh, or, or a realist. Uh, work of fiction, um, and, I, and I think there's this really fascinating interplay uh, between uh, you know the, the playfulness of that and, and, and the humor of that, but then also this, you have this ability to turn things uh, into pathos, like without when, when the reader's least expecting it, and, and suddenly this work that feels like. Uh, you know, maybe at one moment, like a like a, a riff on a genre becomes ex you know it feels deeply personal all of a sudden. And I wonder, like, what is the relationship for you between like the personal and and, and the creative when you're going through the writing process? Well, probably the most personal thing about it is when I start a book, I think I know something, mm. um, and when I'm finished it, I realize that I was wrong. Um, <laughs> And after writing this many books, I know less than most people. <laughs> uh, well on my way to knowing nothing. <laughs> and that's kind of my goal. I, I, I really, it, it's a good feeling. It's, it's, a, it's a nice feeling. Um, I never think about genre. Mm. Uh, I, I think about people's expectations. Um, and I think sort of unconsciously genre shows up in it so I can subvert the expectations that readers have. It, and it goes back to the use of humor with, with, with I, one of my in, instructors is Mark Twain. Um, I, I believe that, that if I can, not only by extension genre, but humor is a way to disarm a reader. If I can get you laughing, then I can do other you know, more awful shit to you. <laughs> <laughs> and that's really all I care about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, Ling, we, we've talked about that before, too, where y you talk about often when you're, when you're at work on a piece of fiction, you suddenly find yourself trying to solve very particular problems, and then the solutions you come up with uh, are, are quite inventive in the way that you, uh, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> deliver characters and creatures and, and, and situations to us. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that as well. Um, I remember what my thesis advisor, uh, J. Robert Lennon, uh, said to me once that when I said, oh, I'm writing this novel, in a very grandiose way, I said to him, I'm writing this novel because I'm trying to find some answers. And he said, actually, when I write a novel, I'm just trying to figure out what the question is. And that stayed with me because I don't <laughs> very often, like Percival, when I begin writing something, um, I actually don't know the, I think I know the question I'm posing, but there's often a question buried underneath that one um, that I excavate. Um, and I do that just by trying to inhabit the scenarios and the characters um, and trying to sort of immerse myself in them fully. Um, trying to lose myself, really. Uh, yeah. Um, 
Darren, uh, I was going to ask you a question, and I completely forgot what it was. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to say, place for me is something that um, um, in Alaska, where, I, where I'm from, you cannot tell a snowstorm, the land, and the sea. So you're in a squalor. You're, you're blinded by the sun and the snow and the light. And so that place for me is light. And that's where I want to say I live. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, hearing you say that, too, mm -hmm. it, 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 you know, it, it's very clear to me like why your genre is poetry. Yes. And I wonder, how do you feel that way? Did you ever try to write something that wasn't poetry? Or has, has poetry always been the, the best mode of expression for you? It has been the best mode. And I... Um, I'm dabbling now with hybrid form, and I want to explore prose more. But I don't understand um, prose as well as poetry. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm just learning now. And so um, writing the book is an experience for me that, that is profound. And I, I don't know where I'm going, but I'll know when I get there. Mm. What, are so, like, what are some challenges in you know, moving from poetry to prose for you? Um, the long sense of the line, mm. um, the, um, the long sense of a gathering and um, developing into, like say a novel or a piece of long prose. I'm, I'm working with prose form in Renga, which is an ancient um, tradition from the Asian culture. And what I do with that, it's prose, and then you have a haiku block at the end. It's a block paragraph with prose. And so I'm dabbling with longer form, and um, some of the, the restrictions for me, the concise clarity mm. um, is what I'm after, and the, the shortness of it, mm. and how you can um, bring feeling to the page and to the world in such a way with just a clear, concise, tight language mm. other than expansive and grander. And But I'm learning to do that mm. as I go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I think that's a real, you know, an interesting thing that I like to think about too is, you know, as somebody who writes poetry, I also, you know, my approach is always very much about the sound and thinking about the rhythm and, and the structures and, and you know, the, visu the visual arrangement of things on the page. And, you know, I, I think sometimes we don't often talk about some of those things in prose. And I wonder, like, Darren, how do you approach, like, do you think about the rhythm of the sentences that you're writing and how that those relate to, the, relate to yeah. each other sonically? And, and how does that work for you? So I ostensibly write nonfiction, but I use mm -hmm. countless fictional techniques uh, all the time. And the language, uh, again, the part of the world I come from, it's not a literary place. And even the literary figures that come from there, like Seamus Heaney would be the most famous person who comes from, from my county. Um, he luxuriates in language. You know, he, he really, you can taste the language at times. And it's so particular to that place. But because it's so particular, it's so universal. It's a vernacular that is almost defiant, you know, against um, what we would say is a sort of hegemony of the English language. Mm. So I, I follow in, in that that oral sense of of the spoken word and trying to translate that. And and really, I read dictionaries, I read encyclopedias, I read much more material like that than I do mm. books, um, mm. conventional novels, or anything. Um, so there's that sense of being fascinated by language, but part of that is the limitations of language too. Um, you know, language, I, I really like pushing up against the, the untranslatable. Mm -hmm. In a sense, we're kind of translators. We look at a landscape and we think, right, how can I translate that into words? Language is an incredibly useful medium, but it has limitations. Mm -hmm. And uh, if, you ever, if you ever want to give yourself a nervous breakdown, you should read uh, Wittgenstein's Tractatus, which is very <laughs> much about the limitations of language and thoughts, and it's it's a real trip. But um, I love uh, 
I love the untranslatable aspect. I love that failure that we have, the challenge of that. And, you know, I, I read a lot about music, actually, in, in both my mm. sort of freelance journalism side. And there was a saying, I think it was like Frank Zappa, someone said that writing about music is like dancing about architecture. Mm. <laughs> and, I w and he said it like it was a bad thing. I was like, dancing about architecture sounds pretty good. Like, I could do that, so that's, that's what I do for a living. I dance about architecture. <laughs> Ling, you, now you, your most recent, but your first book was a novel, so you kind of, you know, did the beginning writer thing yeah. backwards, and then your second book was the the book of short stories. And I, I wonder how how does rhythm come into play? Like, how does that different? How, how does that how is that different in writing a longer form work versus a, a short form work of fiction? Hmm. Well, as to the question about rhythm and the line, um, you know, I did this. I showed my students. Um, I've done this a presentation with my students before where I show them the rough draft of a story that I had and then I showed them the final version. And the rough draft, if you were to read it out loud, it sounds almost like baby talk or something <laughs> like baby speak. And it was, sometimes it was just collecting uh, little details here and there and maybe I was inhabiting the scene and I needed certain details. But and the voice was very different and kind of bumbling around. It sounded like, it was like bumper cars. It would bump into something, move somewhere else, swerve wildly <laughs> somewhere else, bump into something else. For me, if by the third or fourth draft, if the language doesn't come together, um, well, well, I should say that I think the reason for this, for this, the way the first draft sound for me is because English is the second language. Um, but if by like the third or the fourth draft, if uh, if the language doesn't come into focus, if it doesn't uh, become more streamlined, um, if it beco doesn't become, I guess, if it doesn't have what I want, um, I, I think the idea that I started with is wrong. That leads me to think the initial idea, something about it was wrong. Um, so that's what I would say about, I guess, the line. I used to shelve books at the Topeka Shawnee County Public Library in Topeka, Kansas. And the book that I checked out the most, you know, I would read tons of books while I was there, but the one I checked out the most was um, the collected poems of Frank O'Hara. Mm. And he taught me a lot about voice. There's this essay he wrote about personism where he says, you know, if you're running down the street because someone's behind you trying to stab you, you don't turn around and describe that person's like outfit <laughs> or something. <laughs> and that uh, little insight was so gave me so much um, so much instruction about yeah. writing voice because I have so many you know first person narrators. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that essay. <laughs> I think the exact line is, if somebody's chasing you down the street with a knife, you don't turn around and say, hey, I was a track star at Mineola That's Prep. Right. You just run. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> um, Percival, we had a really hilarious conversation uh, recently on the podcast about when we were talking about uh, Ellison's Invisible Man, mm -hmm. and we were talking about all the jazz uh, that he talks about uh, and, and refers to in the, in the book. And, but then you said, you know, when I, when I read him and when I listen to the rhythms of his prose, I don't hear any jazz at all. It sounds very kind of regular. And, and I wonder, you know, how, is that something that you're thinking about as you're trying to move through your own prose? I wish I could remember. Um, I, I don't, I really don't remember working on things. But I, I get accused of having syncopation mm. in, in the rhythm of my prose. And I, um, and I think that's probably true, um, but the 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 rhythm the rhythm of of, of, of bebop is so ingrained in me um, that I'm I'm sure the phrasing is is there and rhythm is quite important to me. But I I never stop and and do any second order thinking about it. Mm. Um, um, there are other things that I'm thinking about as, as I'm working. I I just trust that that if the rhythm's not right, I just can't keep going. Mm. Um, but I see. But I'm also so influenced 
by 20th century um, uh, surrealistic music that um, I'm always trying to construct the novel in a way where I'm at least considering a new language. Mm. Um, that's not so much um, a new language of, of, of vocabulary, but a new, a new structural language for, for in my case, the, the novel. Mm. Um, it's my Jimi Hendrix impression. I, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> and and so and and so it, then I start thinking about the rhythm of it, but it's not on a sentence level. It's 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 more in the a picture of the entire entire thing, and I and I try to find ways to uh, employ dissidence, mm -hmm. and 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 find a place to insert to continue the metaphor notes that are, for lack of a better way of saying it, hard on the ear. Mm. Picking up some feedback here somewhere. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's usually a reaction to what I say. <laughs> <laughs> so first of all, you've been, you know, I think we, we, we probably have a lot of creative writing students here and creative writers or would-be creative writers. And, you know, you're somebody who's been teaching creative writing for a long time. Um, That's a nice way of putting it. Thank you. Yeah. Michael, Michael well, just called me old. <laughs> <laughs> well, you could have started young. <laughs> um, but I wonder... You know, I mean, you, as somebody who is ex very experienced in uh, in teaching creative writing, what do you feel that you can teach to somebody else about writing? Okay. My my students come to me and say, "Can you teach me how to write a novel?" And my answer is quite easy. No, <laughs> I, I cannot. Uh, and the reason for this is 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 I don't know how to write a novel. Um, I have done it apparently many times. Um, from all evidence, um, I'm sorry, I will probably do it again. <laughs> uh, um, but when I do it again, it will be because I reinvent it. Um, I have to make it up. Um, there's no formula for me, and I don't think there is for anyone writing literary novels. First of all, I have to say about poems um, that I wish I could write a poem, and 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 I've been trying. Um, I have a, actually have books of poems that I that I write to prove that I cannot write a poem. <laughs> um, and what's interesting is I as as when I go to the poetry. I don't have the same musicality mm -hmm. that I like because I'm doing that abstract thing mm -hmm. that I want to do in the fiction. Mm -hmm. um, but back to students, what can I teach? Um, I, I, I teach them how to read. Um, how to read, uh, not like writers, because when I started reading like a writer, I just want to shoot myself. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Reading like a well, the panel, uh, reading like a reader. Mm -hmm. um, remembering why I ever wanted to do this and why I ever mm -hmm. enjoyed reading is, is it's thrilling to me. And when I read that way, then I write. Um, I, you know, I view it as a, a real offense and um, um, uh, a failure on my part if anyone reads something I've written and they think about me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, that's not what I want. Mm. Uh, how about you, Ling? You've, I know you've taught a lot of creative writing as well. What do you feel like you can teach? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I don't think I can teach them how to write a novel either, as Percival said, but I think what I can teach them is maybe how to get out of their own way mm -hmm. and maybe teach them the conditions or circumstances uh, that would be conducive to writing. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that is um, 
uh, giving yourself permission, allowing yourself to um, understanding that all of the fears that you have as a writer, they're never going to go away. But can you sit with them while you're for an hour or however long while you're writing? Um, I think uh, maybe it's because when I first started uh, out, when I was a younger writer, I I was very afraid. <laughs> I was very afraid to write, and so I have. I feel empathy for, especially for those students who have that fear and still want to, um, yeah. Mm. Now, do you, as a writer, ever experience so-called writer's block? I think up until I was about, on and off, up until I was about 30, yeah. Mm. And then, I don't know what changed. I think I got laid off and I thought, oh, it's just a game, <laughs> and I can do whatever I want. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I, I did get laid off, and I did somehow think, I don't want to go into another office job. And th go, thinking back, because I did get asked this question recently of like, the moment you knew you would be a writer, I've never known that I've wanted to be a writer, but I've always felt the need, the continual need to escape, and that continually drives me both to be a reader, as a child to be a reader, and maybe as an adult later to be a writer. Mm. Darren, you've talked a lot about that too, that desire to escape and like the looking at the maps and, and the escaping into um, the imagination. Do you find that when you're writing, it feels like an escape or do you feel like it's, it's work? <laughs> It's not an escape, <laughs> no. <laughs> it's uh, an illness of some kind. <laughs> it's purgatorial. It's, um, mm -hmm. I try and physically escape, so I work, in, I work in old men's pubs in London, mostly. I don't have an office. Um, and uh, so I try and physically get out of the house and go somewhere else. And I've started going to a place called Highgate, which is where Coleridge uh, went to um, get rid of his opium addiction. Mm. So I go there and I, I'll sit in pubs and um, physically try and get out of my life a little bit, get out of the routines, put myself where I can see people and l overhear people and just see things happening that might be some kind of inspiration or kind of visual cues. But I think there's an interiority to writing. I, I'm just going further and further inside. I don't even mean myself, but I mean inside something. I wrote this essay recently on, on um, Tom Waits, and uh, I had this, m this image throughout of, of the idea of um, the junkyard. Like, I think all the books I'm ever going to write are already done, uh, but the material hasn't been assembled yet, so it's all there. The junkyard is all there, all the pieces, and I just have to get in and take all the bits and put them together. But all the material is already there. Um, and more material will be added, of course, as I grow older. If I'm lucky enough to go to different places, more junk goes in there. But it's an assemblage for me. It's a sort of, um, so if there's any kind of escape, it's escape into that junkyard, whatever that is. And it's a junkyard, really, of, of memory. It's pieces of memory, it's fragments of things. And um, I'm trying to make sense of it all. Mm. And it may be that there is no sense, mm. um, but it's, it's not a bad way to spend a life. Mm. Uh, I've done worse <laughs> jobs. <laughs> <laughs> Haven't we all? Yeah. <laughs> DJ, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about your writing process. Well, do you write every day? I do four to six hours a day. And I, I just, I just enthrall myself up to the page. I give myself to the page. And then I'm able to discover everything that I need to discover. Mm. And I have my books. I might be reading five books at a time, but they all kind of some way come together. And um, that way I'm able to access language. Um, not being a speaker of my language, um, it's not my first language. And so, I don't know um, what it is, but the sound and the lyric is there. 
And um, I think it comes naturally, and I play with assonance and consonance all the time and um, use that language as music in movement, as water, as snow, as the natural world. And I bring that natural world into the writing only because I know it so well. I grew up living it, fishing, hunting, and surviving. My older brother's a whaling captain for my community, and um, we're no longer whaling because the whales are going away. And we know this change, we know it. And with that, I'm changing as well, and so are we all. And we're in this flux and flow, like water, like earth, like sand, like the grass, the wind, taste, touch, feel, smell, and, um, and sight. And um, I try to use those senses because we're all human. We have those senses, and it needs to be brought about in the language and that feeling and emotion to the language to convey communication and to bring about resolution for the interior and exterior world. Mm. And that's how I resolve it. Mm. Yes. Mm. How do you know when you've gotten a resolution? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I feel like I, uh, on the video, I said, I feel like a thousand marmots running across the tundra. And that's how I feel when I write. I feel like a marmot excited because they're very playful. And they're very, um, they're just so human. And we are as well like them. And so I, I've watched them throughout my life. And that playfulness is where I live too. And I learned from them. They have taught me so much. Mm. And um, I try to share that with the world, everything that I, that I know, and that is no ink and paper, mm -hmm. nihilism. I am nothing. I am nothing but a vessel. I am a hollow bone in which the poetry comes to me through, and I'm just that vessel where it has already been written before. Everything has been written before. And, um, with that, I'm able to be a conduit then with the language and, and use it as a tool at reading and writing. And it is a, a, a form of discipline, and I believe that is it's so important, um, the discipline of every day, at least four to six hours of reading and writing. Mm. First of all, 30 books. <laughs> Ever had writer's block? <laughs> Uh, you know, I, my, my students come to me occasionally and say they have writing blocks. And I say, no, you don't. <laughs> and they say, no? I say, there's no such thing. Give me 20 pages by Friday or you fail. <laughs> <laughs> and I get 20 pages by, by Friday. Um, and they, maybe they're not 20 good pages, mm -hmm. but we can work on 20 bad pages. We can't work on zero pages. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to, if you, if you, I'm the laziest person in the world. I, 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 I don't work every day. I don't think about working every day. I don't have a schedule. My parents died thinking that all I did was ride horses and play tennis. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, talking after uh, Gigi is, mm -hmm. is, is, it's like somebody's playing a harp and then you go to the guy with the cymbals. <laughs> 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 so, uh, so thank you, Michael. <laughs> sure thing. <laughs> um, no, if, 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 if anybody comes to me uh, during the day and says, well, let's go to a movie, I go to a movie. <laughs> um, for me, work will happen. Um, the only thing that, whatever productivity I, I seem to suggest comes from the fact that, and this is constitutional, I, I don't feel stress. Mm. I don't worry. Um, um, mm. It's just books. Uh, it's the most important thing to me, but you know, I have kids. And I tell my graduate students when they're all upset and worked up, and they, I say, 
Uh, just relax. It's just books. <laughs> you know, take care of your family. Um, and that's, mm. and that's, what, that's what gets me through it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was kind of curious, um, are y'all like a one book at a time type reader or do you read several things at once? I feel like I heard one of you mention that, I forget who, uh, that it's kind of like five books at once, oh yeah, five books at once and kind of like feeling that out. Um, so I'm kind of curious because I also read like five, six books at a time. So, And I feel like it can be kind of like contentious with other folks. They're like one at a time only. So. Yeah, just curious. <laughs> I, I uh, read one book at a time. I have really bad insomnia, so I, I try and read a book at night, um, as my partner will attest. Um, in the dark, usually on my phone, a PDF. <laughs> um, but I write, uh, I write numerous books at the same time. I spin lots of plates and just see what, which one lands first. So. My agents have two books that I'm working on at the moment, and I've just started a third, and they're going to fire me out of a cannon if I start a fourth. They're just going <laughs> to be like, no more books until we, we get one sorted. So I would be very, yeah, I need, I, need, I need to constantly be working on different things because of different moods and different interests I have. Um, so there's one that's quite a Cormac McCarthy type book, uh, I don't know where that came from, but um, <laughs> and then the other one is um, a book about hedonism, and then there's another book about the Spanish Armada. So it's a form of trying to organise a whirlwind. It's 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 chaos really, and you just see what sort of crash lands out of the whirlwind first. But I need I need to have that whirlwind. I can't. Um, my mind is not a an orderly place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How about you, Lee? Um, I usually have several books open at a time, and they're, well, okay, with fiction, I can only do one book at a time, but with other things uh, like nonfiction, um, I can do usually multiple books. I tend to read more nonfiction um, than fiction lately, and as for projects, I usually have a couple things working at a time. I, I read about five or six books at a time, and I take the information in, and then I'm able to decipher what I need to do. But I don't know the way. It's lost, like the squall, like in King Lear at the end, I feel like this, this whirlwind is happening, and I'm going mad. But actually, I'm, I don't know anything, like Percival has said. And by the time I get to the end, I, I found out that I've learned much more than I've given. And that giving and receiving, that reciprocity is something that I love. It's something of joy and peace to me. And it brings me less stress mm -hmm. then. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> First of all, could you say something poetic, please? <laughs> 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 When I started reading something, and, um, um, the first thing I realized is, wow, this person is a lot smarter than I am, and I don't know what I'm reading about. So I have to back up and, 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 and read about what this person is starting with. So, it's, so, I, so I end up reading four or five books that the book I am reading has sent me to. Um, mm -hmm. and, and as you and it's an infinite regression. <laughs> so, so there's this book that I started, but I have read 27 books and before I've gotten through the first chapter of, <laughs> of, of, of this book. Um, but I love that. Um, um, and the, the, the embarrassing part of this is, is, is almost everything for me reduces to some sort, kind of philosophical thing about language and, and even more boring, uh, logic, and so I end up reading what I have writ what I read all the time, which is math, mm -hmm. and and um, and that may be a retreat, an escape to where I feel most comfortable, mm -hmm. but that's mm -hmm. what I, I, 
I have a question for Percival. I've read all of your books that are on Hoopla, and I often wonder, as an author, do you get anything when people read your books on Hoopla? If I knew what Hoopla was, I'd be able to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, beginning, I'm pretty sure I'm not, if, I, if this is how I suppose. Um, well, I'm, I'm pleased that you're reading um, my books anywhere <laughs> you can find them. I, I don't, I'm the worst business person in the world, so I, um, um, for all I know, my publisher is just giving my books away or, or keeping all the profits because I haven't seen them. Um, I don't know. I don't know what it is. I've no, you know, I don't go online. Um, I read email, and and I used to go to and I go to eBay to buy broken guitars, but that's about the extent of my internet. I'm assuming this is a some kind of internet entity or. It's a library ebook borrowing like app. Drive. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm still processing everything that Michael just said. <laughs> the, the app part always throws me. Um, I'm, cool. I'm glad. Um, <laughs> Can you talk to us about yeah, briefly about your favorite authors and do you tend to read the same things, the same the same books, or you kind of you, you always want to find some some new author, new or new book. Or new before, genre, whatever. Before DG, you can say anything. <laughs> there are books I return to, to all the time. Um, uh, Samuel Butler's The Way of All Flesh, um, I read every year. Um, may not even be my favorite book, but I, but I, but I do read it every year. Um, the Glass Constellation by Arthur Z. Is he's my professor and my teacher for a long time, for 25 years. And um, his work, I just went to the Beinecke and um, went downstairs and was able to see all of his manuscripts. And I was able to research for a little while, just a little while, half hour I got. And I was shown all of these manuscripts by Vine Deloria, who's native, and um, Mr. Redhoff, who's here and some of the other writers um, that I know. And, and they have a lot of um, native things, but um, I wasn't able to get to them because I dwelt into Arthur's work and I just couldn't leave. I was there forever, it felt like. And I, I'm so excited to be able to go back and research. So yes, yeah. yeah. Lee? Um, well, I guess I'll... The first book that came to mind when you asked about um, favorite authors or favorite books is, um, I think it's kind of underrated. It's So Long, See You Tomorrow by William Maxwell. And I think it, it's such an interesting form because it starts out what seems like a memoir and then he does this magic tr trick where he progresses into fiction and you know exactly, he tells you exactly what he's doing as he's doing it and it doesn't dispel the spell somehow. Um, I think I've, I think about that book a lot um, lately, yeah. I try to read, I think I've done it, uh, yeah, it's ever since I was a child. Um, I try to read A Christmas Carol every Christmas Eve um, because it's so atmospheric, but also it's a real master class in how to tell a story. I mean, every single line is, is genius, and um, it's, all, it's all you really need, actually. A, a story like that is all you really need to be, to be taught. Um, you can be taught strategies and things, but it's all, it's all in that, and, and now I've got a, a little boy. Um, I can read it with my son every year, which is, um, which is a wonderful ritual. Uh, the writers that I come back to most are writers like Camus, um, James Baldwin, Toni Morrison. And the reason for that, they are totally different to my style of writing and what I'm, um, my interests really, but they have, they're just a reminder to myself of what moral courage looks like. They're writers that remind me that I can't be like them, um, but I can try, you know, um, they're like colossi, if that's a word. Um, so I check in every now and then with them, mm. just to remind myself, like Percival said, 
you have to remind yourself of why you got into this in the first place, because the industry can be can ground you down a little bit, and you have to go back and, and remember, I was that kid reading Robert Louis Stevenson. That's the moment, and, and you recharge off that again. Um, but then to keep your way and, and to keep some kind of backbone, I guess, um, or integrity, you have to consult the elders. And mm -hmm. for me, it's Camus, Morrison, and Baldwin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Well, I think we're running out of time here. Um, for those of you who want to hear more about uh, the writers that influenced these four writers, you can listen to the Wyndham Campbell Prizes podcast. Uh, we did half-hour episodes which, with all the recipients this year. Uh, Percival and I talked about Ellison's Invisible Man. DJ and I talked about Laylee Long Soldier's Whereas. Uh, Ling and I talked about Rachel Ingalls' Mrs. Caliban. Uh, and Darren and I talked about uh, Italo Calvino's uh, Invisible Cities, as well as the other four writers. We, uh, we all did episodes together. So uh, check it out. It's on Apple, Spotify, all those different places if you want uh, to listen to it. Uh, but in the meantime, thanks, everybody, for coming out. Thanks, everybody, Thank you. for participating. Bravo.